purpose. Welcome back everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the second round of the Grand Swiss, which is being held here in the Isle of Man, which to be clear for everyone who's watching is a dependency of the United Kingdom, but not actually part of the UK itself, as many people reminded me in the comments to my previous video. All right, round number two. Now the big match, of course, on board number one, we have Fabiano Caruana playing with the white pieces against Hans Neiman himself. Now, Fabiano crushed Hans with a black piece in the second to last round, I believe it was, the U.S. Championship to ensure his second U.S. Championship victory in a row. And today they square off again with Fabiano having won every single game up to this point. Now, unlike the previous four encounters with Fabiano has won with the black pieces, today Fabiano has the white pieces. So the game starts with E4. We get the move E5 being played here by Hans, and now we get Knight to F3, Knight to C6, and now the move Bishop to B5. And here Hans plays Knight F6, essaying the classic Berlin defense. Now, I was obviously in the playing hall as this game was starting, and I did notice that Fabiano was a little bit surprised by this opening choice. I suspect that he was not expecting Hans to play Knight F6, but one of the other systems that he played played in the U.S. Championship. Now, I think that trying to surprise Fabiano with the system, the Berlin specifically, which you have not played a lot yourself, and playing against a player like Fabiano has mounds and mounds of experience in this is a little bit questionable just because Fabiano is able to draw upon his great memory and pick a variation at the board. So we get D3 being played here by Fabiano. Of course, he is in no mood to force a draw here. He does have the white pieces around too, so we don't get one of these classic repetitions with the 10-move draw, which has happened many, many times online. So we have D3 being played, bishop to c5 played by Hans, we get bishop takes c6, d takes c6, and now the move h3 is played. Now if white were to capture what looks like a free pawn on e5, this would be a very serious mistake, because after queen to d4, black threatens checkmate on f2, all the while attacking this knight on e5. So, we get h3 from Fabiano, basically the idea is to stop either bishop g4 to pin the knight, or knight g4 trying to pressure the pawn on f2. We get knight to d7, guarding the pawn on e5, Fabiano plays knight c3, we get castles, bishop to e3, and now Hans plays bishop d6. Now, this is a situation where it's very tricky to decide whether to play bishop d6 or trade the bishops off. On the one hand, trading the bishops makes sense, because white gets these two pawns that are stacked on top of each other. On the other hand, bishop d6 also makes a lot of sense because black keeps the two b's. So we get castles, rook to e8 is played, knight d2 played by Fabiano, knight to f8, knight to c4, and now we get the move knight to g6. Now what Hans is aiming for for with this knight maneuver is he wants to stop Fabiano pl from playing f4. Now d4 is always a possibility, but if white could say get something like knight takes d6, cd6, and f4 here, white is a little bit better with the open f file down the road. So we get knight g6 to stop white from playing f4, but now we have this very critical move d4 being played, and here Hans makes a fairly serious mistake with this move bishop e6. Now, I attribute this mistake to the fact that Hans is not a traditional Berlin player. He does not play it all that frequently, and so he misunderstands the pawn structure here. So... After we get this move bishop to e6, we have knight takes d6 being played in this position by Fabiano, and now we get the move c takes d6 and d5. Now, if I were playing here with black, I would take on d4, and after say knight takes d6 here, you can play queen takes d6, queen takes d4, takes, takes, and f5, and black probably is okay in this position because you're going to activate the light square bishop, and the pawn on c2 will be a little bit loose down the road. Additionally, these double pawns are actually very valuable. The pawn on c6 specifically prevents the knight from jumping to either b5 or d5. So we get bishop to e6, knight takes d6 is played, c takes d6, and now we have this move d5 from Fabiano. We get c takes d5, knight takes d5, and already here, even though black is not much worse, white has a very comfortable position. You have this backwards weak pawn on d6, you've got this great knight on d5 as well, and already Fabiano is very much in the driver's seat with pretty much zero risk. So... In this position after takes, we get queen to d7 big played. You'll also notice this is quite similar to a lot of Sicilians. For example, if I go back to the start of the game, one of the most common Sicilians that you'll see is something like the Shveshnikov, where again, you get a very, very similar setup where white wants to put a knight on d5 and play against these two pawns on d6 and e5. So... In this position, we get queen d7, queen to d3 played by Fabi to try and put a rook on d1 and pressure the pawn on d6 down the road. 
Hans plays bishop takes d5. Now, I think this is a very big mistake from Hans. Probably here, he should have played something like b6, followed by rook a8, not rook c8 right away, because then white could maybe take the pawn on a7. Although, I think here, maybe there's some tactics. But at any rate, I think trying to put the rook on the open file is a little bit better, because after takes, takes a knight to e7, we get to move queen to d3 from Fabi. And now this pawn is a serious problem. You have rook d1 here, maybe rook c1 and c4, and black is already in a lot of trouble. So... Hans, when he took on d5, no doubt intended to play for this move d5 here to try and simplify the position. But now after e takes d5, queen takes d5, and rook f d1, Hans is much worse. And the reason primarily is that white is this great bishop on this diagonal, targeting the pawn on a7. You also have a three on two majority on the queen side here. And additionally, you're going to be able to claim this d file for your rook, creating the classic kebab. So now we get rook e d8 here from Hans. Fabi plays queen to e2, which is not the best move. Queen to a3 is a little bit better here, lining up the classic right triangle. Now it's a little bit interesting that Fabi did not play queen to a3 because Fabiano, more so than any other player, really does like having the queen in return for the two rooks. So we get queen to e2 instead. We have queen to a5 being played. We get queen to g4. Nice move here. Maybe ideas like bishop h6. Maybe ideas like rook d7. All the while also keeping an idea of hitting this pawn on a7. So here Hans blunders with queen a6. Now already here I think it's a very difficult position to play for black. Computer wants to move queen to c7, but after this move c3 simply avoiding hanging the pawn, it's not really clear what black should do. If you play a move like b6, white has bishop g5 pinning this knight. You cannot play f6 here because after bishop takes pawn, white is simply winning the game. So with this pin, the pressure on the D file, it feels very, very unpleasant, but in typical computer fashion, it says after king f8, black is completely fine. Instead, Hans plays queen a6, and now Fabiano trades the rooks on d8 and plays this move rook to d1, offering to trade off all the rooks here, and effectively, black is simply lost now. Now again, looking at it as a beginner, probably like, well, how can black be lost? Material is even, what's the big deal? The main reason black is in so much trouble is that black is not going to be able to prevent infiltration on the D file, or avoid losing a pawn on a7. So we get rook to a being played by Hans here. Desperation time, if you trade the rooks here, you have to play a move like knight to c6, stopping queen d8, but after queen to d7 here, if you play h6, after checking queen f7, white guards a2, targets a pawn on b7, and white is simply up a pawn and will win the game shortly. If you play g6 here, now white has bishop to h6, cutting off the squares for the king, and queen to e8 will be checkmate very shortly. So, Hans plays the move rook to a8 instead here, trying to keep pieces on the board, but now Fabiano plays rook d7, creating the classic kebab on the 7th rank. We get the move knight to g6, and now queen to f3 is played, targeting both of the pawns on f7 and b7, and of course creating the classic right triangle. We get queen takes a2 from Hans, trying to guard the pawn on f7, b3 played here by Fabiano, another great move, cutting off the protection of the pawn on f7, and now the queen is simply offsides on a2. So here we get knight to h8 being played by Hans to guard the pawn. If you were to play a move like f6, white can take the pawn on b7, you're hitting the rook, but you're also going to be checkmating on the 7th rank with castle mania. And if you play rook to f8, trying to guard the pawn this way, white has bishop c5, and again, you will lose the rook or the pawn on f7, and white will win the game. So here we get knight to h8, Fabi plays queen takes b7, we get rook to e8, queen to c6 played here, a nice move, guarding the pawn on c2, but also threatening to take the pawn on a7, or create some other fossils with the queen attacking this rook on e8. We have h6 played here by Hans, rook takes a7 played by Fabiano, queen b1, king to h2, and now Hans plays rook f8. Now the main problem for Hans here is even though he's down a pawn, he's got this knight that's simply on this h8 square, horribly placed. Additionally, Fabiano has these two passed pawns that he can just start pushing up the board. So we get queen c4, and now rook d8 is played. Again, if, if Hans tries to bring the knight into the game, there's bishop c5 attacking the rook, and black will lose the game. So we have rook to d8. We get the move b4. Fabi finally decides he's done with the game, so he's going to start pushing the p. We get rook to b8, and now c3 played, guarding the pawn on b4. Hans plays rook d8 back. Fabi plays queen to a2. Not the only move. b5 is also playable, but understandably, Fabiano is worried about the boogeyman with something like rook d1, b6, and maybe some idea like check and queen g6 here. Of course, white is still winning after queen g4, but there's no need to take that risk. 
So we get queen to a2 instead, and Fabiano knows that if queens come off the board here, these two pawns are just going up the board and ending the game immediately. So we get queen to e4. Fabi plays b5 here, now with no ideas of checks on the back rank, he's free to push the peak. We get king to h7, b6 played by Fabi, just keep pushing p up the board. We get f5 here, and now queen to a4 played, again offering the trade of the queens. Hans cannot trade the queens, he has to try and go for some desperation with queen b1 and rook d1 again. But Fabiano now plays queen to h4, attacking the rook, but also setting up a very, very deadly threat of queen takes h6 check. King g8 and queen g7 mate. So Hans plays rook d6, guarding the pawn against the captures on h6. We get queen to e7 played, pressuring the pawn, the rook, and the pawn as well. We get rook g6 from Hans. And after Fabiano plays queen takes e5, Hans Neiman resigns this game, and Fabiano moves to two out of two. Now, this game is simply a masterclass in understanding of the Berlin pawn structure from Fabiano. Pretty much from around move 15 or so, he just slowly kept improving on his position, kept playing good moves one after another after another. Hans really did not have many opportunities to save this game. There were maybe a couple moments very early on after this D5 pawn push when he maybe could have made some improvements to save it. But overall, Fabiano was outclassing Hans pretty much this whole game. And with this huge win, not only does Fabiano move to two out of two and take the lead in the tournament, he also crosses 2,800 for the first time in a couple of years. So great performance from Fabiano. So now let's take a look at my game from the second round of the Grand Swiss here in Isle of Man. Now, after a tough draw where I was in a lot of trouble yesterday against Rasmus Svein from Germany, today I play against Ranak Sadwani from India. Now, Ranak is a player that I've played against many times online over the last couple of years. I think when I first started playing, he might have been like 2450, 2460. He's improved, and now his rating is all the way at 2641, so he is in the big, big time, or he's part of the show. So... Ranek starts with e4. I play the move c5. Obviously, after drawing the first game, I still want to try to play aggressively. And when in doubt, the Sicilian is probably the most aggressive try, as we saw yesterday when Fabiano actually won in the first round with it against Ivan Seric. So you get the move c3. Now, Sadwani normally plays moves like knight f3 or knight c3, but he decides instead to play the c3 Sicilian, or what is known as the Alipin. Now, I spent a couple of minutes here trying to figure out what exactly I wanted to do, and ultimately I decided that I would play d5, takes, takes, d4, and I played this move g6. Now, this is considered a little bit dubious, perhaps, according to modern theory, but nonetheless, I felt that Raonic would not be ready for this. I, I already would be taking him out of preparation. Clearly, he was prepared when he played c3 on move 2, so he tried to out, he tried to out-prepare me, and now I try to surprise him back and just from this point on, we get to play a game. Now, I felt pretty good about this because Ranak does not normally play the Alipin, and G6 is not a system that is all that commonly played. In fact, I think for myself, I've only ever played in one game, all the way back in the World Mind Sports Olympiad in Beijing, China, and I want to say maybe 2012 or 2014, but a very, very, very long time ago. So after G6, we get Knight F3. Bishop to g7, Ranek plays knight a3, I take the pawn, he goes knight b5 here, trying to go for the classic family fork with knight c7, forking the king, the queen, and the rook. So here I play knight a6, stopping the fork, and he goes bishop to e3. Now the reason Ranek plays bishop e3 is that he's not content to simply capture the knight here, because if we get some position like this, for example, I can always go e5 and kick this knight out of the center of the board. So Ranek plays bishop e3 instead. Of course, I cannot take the bishop because then I would do a Botez gambit and lose the game because it's not bullet. So after bishop to e3, I go knight f6, but now the point behind bishop e3 is revealed. Ranek does not want to capture on d4 with one of the knights. Instead, he wants to try and create a wooden shield, but most importantly, he wants to pressure the pawn on a7. So here I decide to castle. Ranek plays bishop to e2 after a very long thing. Now, this was still a line that I looked at, fairly, or there still was theory. I was within my opening preparation up to this point. I was really hoping that Ranek might play this move. Knight takes a7, because after this move, bishop to g4, the position gets very, very sharp right away, and black is actually a little bit better here. So... Ranek instead plays bishop to e2, and now I go b6 here. The idea is simply I want to stop white from capturing the pawn on a7, but after castles, I can go now also fianchito, my second bishop, and I have the two b's, both being fianchitoed on b7 and g7. 
So here Ronak plays queen h4, an excellent move. Now at this point, I was up about 40 minutes on the clock, so I was feeling pretty good. But unfortunately, the problem is Ronak here, having played so much blitz and probably having watched some of my videos, um, as well as my streams, starts going for what I would say are simpler, logical moves rather than trying to play the absolute best move. Now the computer, for example, likes this idea with a4 and a5, but if you do play a4 and a5, it's not really clear what the next move is going to be after queen h5, because I have ideas like knight d5 or knight g4. And even though the computer thinks white is better after rookie one, you would have to spend maybe five, 10 minutes on these individual moves. And that's not what Ronick wants to do because he's already down 40 minutes. So he plays queen h4. I go queen to c6 here. Now, the reason I played queen c6 is twofold. First of all, I'd love to bring the knight into the action with knight c5, but after knight c7, forking the queen and the rook, I will simply lose a, lose a rook for a knight, and I will lose the game. So I play queen c6 to stop knight c7 with the idea of knight c5, but also I want to keep this knight glued to the f3 square. If white were to play knight fd4, uh-oh, spaghetti the double-A battery strikes, and we have checkmate on g2. So we get knight d4, I play queen c8 back, not queen c7, because then white can play bishop f4, hitting the queen. So queen c8. Bishop h6, and now I play the move knight c5, bringing my knight into the game. And here we get rook fe1. Now, after rook e1, I end up playing this move a6, which was not my initial intention. Originally, I wanted to play this move queen g4 to trade the queens. But after takes, 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 and I think I saw h3 knight f6 here, I was very worried about something like bishop b5 or even maybe something like b4 here. And it felt, felt very scary to me. So instead, I play a6 here, and the idea is simple. I want to go b5 here, or I want to play a6 first of all, so if white plays, say, king h1, I can go rook e8 guarding the pawn, and there's no bishop b5 to hit the rook on e8. Additionally, down the road, I would love to be able to play something like b5 and then go knight a4 and really put pressure on these two pawns on b2 and c3. So I play b. So I play a6 here with to stop bishop b5, also play b5, and just go with the flow. We get knight to e5, played here by Raonic. A good move as white starts taking the central square with d's knights. I go b5 anyway, and now Raonic plays bishop f3. Another move that I really, really like here, because Raonic is playing simple chess, and these moves actually are very logical as well. So I have to trade the bishops. I really don't want to. But if I don't trade the bishops, say I play a move like... Um, What's the move I could play? Something like rook to e8, for example, here. I believe that white has something like knight c6 maybe here to put a lot of pressure on the pawn on e7. And with these knights and the bishop here and all these threats on the king side, it's looking really, really scary for me. So I trade the bishops, Ronak takes with knight, and now I play this move knight to e6. Now, this was not the move that I wanted to play. Initially, I thought maybe I could play something like knight d7, for example. But I thought that after knight d7, white could even trade the knights and then play something like knight e5. Queen c7, and something like rook a d1, or maybe even rook e2 and rook e1, and I felt like white has a small advantage. Additionally, if I were to play something like rook d8, which is another move that makes sense to claim the open file, white has a couple of ways to win, but even besides being able to sack the horse and win the game, there's also knight g5, and these knights are putting a lot of pressure on my kingside pawns, and there's a very good chance that I will lose. So I play knight e6 here, essentially to stop knight g5. But the problem with knight e6 here is that now Rada can just play a quiet move like h3, rook b8, and he can go for this idea with rook e2, followed by rook e1. And I'm really going to struggle here to move this knight, and there are always going to be threats involving a sacrifice for the f7 pawn. So here I play rook b7, which is a bad move. Oddly enough, the computer doesn't think it's that bad. But when I played the move rook to b7, and Ronick played rook e1. My initial idea was to play knight to h5 here, and I very simply overlooked this move knight to g4, guarding the bishop, and here the computer says that white is close to winning. So after rook e1 was played, I got angry at myself for a couple of minutes, but then I decided, look, if you can't play knight h5, what else can you actually do? And luckily for me, there are not many options. If I move my knight to d8, once again, after knight g5, these knights are very, very strong, and there are a lot of threats. As a sample line, say I trade the bishops and play a5 here. White has knight to g4, and here white will be able to remove this knight, which defends the pawn on h7, and white will win the game. So I decided to play rook b6, which is also... Uh, the only move, because if I play a5, for example, white can sack the knight, and after king f7, rook takes e6, queen e6, knight g5, I simply lose the game. If I take with the rook, after rook e6, once again, I'm down a pawn, and white will win. So I play rook b6 to guard the knight against these knight f7 threats, 
Brianna plays rook e3, I go rook d6, he plays rook e2, and now I decide to make a draw by repetition with this move rook b6. Now, I really was unsure if I should make a draw here, because I felt like, considering that he has 13 minutes, I have about 20 minutes here, I maybe should try to play and go for something, but the big problem with going for something is I'm not really sure what I'm going for and how exactly do I create chances. For example, I considered playing a move like knight d5 here, but after knight to g4, there are all these threats um, towards pawn on e7, the knight on e6, threats on the king side as well, and I just don't see what I'm playing for other than simply trying to lose the game. So... Instead, I end up playing playing work to b6 back, and we end up getting this threefold repetition, and the game ends peacefully with a draw. Now, of course, I'm disappointed to draw in the second round. Two draws is not ideal for the start, but at the end of the day, this is an 11-round tournament, so there are a lot of rounds still, still left, and if I gambled and lost in the second round, it very clearly... I, I don't want to say very clearly because there still are many more rounds, but there's a good chance that my tournament would be ruined, and I would also be giving up a lot of rating points as well. So it's better to be safe than sorry as, as, since we're still only in the second round. Now, if this were round 8 or round 9 or round 10, there's a good chance that I would have tried to play on because at that point, there really is no downside to going for it because the situation would be very, very clear. But thus far, after two rounds, to sort of gamble this early, it doesn't feel quite right. So I make the stable draw. I have two draws. I have one point out of two. Tomorrow, hopefully, I will have the white pieces in the third round, and I will give it my best shot. So on that note, I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap of the Fabiano masterpiece against Hans Niemann. And of course, my second round game, which I drew today against a talented Indian Junior, Ron Indian Junior, Ronak Sadwani. So on that note, if you have enjoyed this recap or you like my channel, make sure to smash that subscribe button below if you haven't already. And I will be back tomorrow with a recap after the third 